Recipe for Success, the story behind one of Hampton Road's most prized places. Hi, I'm Kathy Lewis. We come to you this week from a Hampton Roads landmark, a place where generations have gathered to drink their first milkshakes, to celebrate school victories, to court, to gather, and reminisce with old friends. This is Dumars, or Dews as the regulars call it, and it's been a fixture on Monticello Avenue since 1934. And for all those years, Albert Dumar has been behind the counter and out in front, manning the machine that made the world's first ice cream cone at the St. Louis World's Fair back in 1904. The cones keep coming one generation after another. We have been coming here for 28 years, since I was about two and a half. 20 years. And that's, What's your favorite? Thing? Oh, of course the barbecue. The Dumar family has been serving up ice cream cones in Norfolk since, well, since the ice cream cones been around. As the Smithsonian Institution agrees, a fellow named Abe Dumar in 1904 invented this edible American icon. His legacy, 105 years later, a drive-in diner at the corner of 19th and Monticello, where the very same machine is still cranking out the cones. Uh, this is a Ringo. Ringo is uh, vanilla ice cream, chocolate sauce, whipped cream, cherries, and Dumar's phone all crushed up in the bottom. So that's the best. Order up a burger and fries or a Ringo, and if you're a car hop, you gotta know the lingo. Upstairs is coleslaw hot sauce on anything. It could be a cheeseburger with coleslaw hot sauce. It'd be upstairs. Big Daddy is a big cone. Bingo is dummy hot dog. Buckeye is for beer. All the way is mustard, relish, onions. Dressed is just mustard and onion. Combination is cheese, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise. Salt on some bacon bread. <laughs> so, what's the signature Dumar's dinner? It would be a limeade, the barbecue, and an ice cream cone, vanilla. And what's the secret to stirring up those limeades? Small ones always get a quarter of a lime. This is our simple syrup. This is the sweetening aspect. Okay. A couple of pumps of that. Dumar's crushed ice. Other fries to ride. Just soda water. 20 years and I still know how to make them. <laughs> There are lots of folks with the last name Dumar in this operation. So would it be possible to be a Dumar and not go into the family business? I was fascinated with uh, making cones. When I was 11, I was tall enough to work the cone machine, so I started making cones when I was 11. I enjoy working with my family. No matter what problems I face, I know that at some point my granddaddy or my dad has faced the same problem, so I feel like I'm never alone. I enjoy seeing a bunch of different people every day. I try to keep plenty of pictures on the walls because people like history. I know I'm a, I like history, too, and I like to go into a place, and you like to feel like uh, there's something significant about your life all the time or places you go and it's just a special feeling sometimes. I like the nostalgia thing of the restaurant, you know, having car hops and curb service and um, uh, it's old school, we do things the old way. I really enjoy the people. I enjoy meeting people every day. The business plan that was created uh, by Albert's father and his uncle and then the one Albert has massaged over the last 60 years. Dad and I have just tweaked it a little bit. Nothing has really changed. A mix of good business and good old-fashioned hospitality makes this recipe for success. And 87-year-old Albert Dumar keeps the pace, rolling out the cones daily in front of young and old admiring eyes, keeping 3,000 on hand, he says. 
Mr. Dumar, it's just such a pleasure to sit down with you. I'm really appreciating your letting us come in and turn your restaurant a little bit upside down to do this. We're glad to have you. Well, thank right. you very much. What, a, what an amazing place this is. Um, I came to this community almost 30 years ago, and the first thing somebody said when I got here was, you have to go to Dumars. And you, this place is really, really an institution in the Hampton Roads community. Thank you. It all started a long time ago, though. What, 1904? 1904. We were souvenir salesmen at the time, and my uncle was a super salesman. And what he did was he went to the St. Louis Exposition and he ran a store and sold souvenirs at the, a store there. But the shop closed at 6 o'clock every night. And so Abe wanted a part-time job and so he went to work for the Waffle Man. And he told the Waffle Man, what we got to do is roll this waffle up into the shape of a cone and fill it with ice cream. And I'm sure we could pick up our sales. So the man says, well, you're off every night at six o'clock. Why don't you do it? And so he did it. And every night he made ice cream cones on a small waffle iron that was heated by charcoal. And it was one waffle iron, and he could make one at a time. It would it'd take him a whole minute to make a, one waffle. So he took that one waffle iron up there to a machinist in Hoboken and told him, he said, put four of these together. And when you put four of these together, I can make one while three are cooking. And that way, instead of just making 60 an hour, I can make 180 an hour. That's and that's, smart. that's the way he did it. And he made that machine, and he took it to Coney Island, and he got himself three other fellows, and they all went in together, and they made ice cream cones. So is that machine that we see today, is that the same one that that's was used the at that point? That's the same one that we used then. We, we have added things to that machine over the years. So, for instance, we put a new shape on it, and then we put new plates in it. The plates wore out. Wow. <laughs> Eventually, we switched over to propane. Propane gas was far easier and a lot hotter. I know that you, um, on the day that we're visiting you, you're in the morning, you're... Um making the cones in the store, but then there's a lot of days that you're also outside making well, cones too. We really make them in the summertime and the outside too. What happens is we sell a lot of cones without ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> the big jars. Yeah. yeah, and we sell them and put 25 in a jar and sell them to people, you know, you can take ice cream and feed your husband ice cream and he'll get a bowl full. But if you just give him a cone, all he's going to eat is a lot less ice cream. So it's a, that's interesting. So it's, so it's a, it's a diet management philosophy. Here yeah, too. right. So you're taking care of us all at the same time. Right. <laughs> um, and so let's, let's sort of take it back to, we, we've talked a bit about that beginning time that it all started off essentially of, of this cart but but you did he didn't go immediately to this location right there was no, another location no at the time. he went to Coney Island to start with and uh, what he decided that what he's going to do is go into the state fairs mm. and that time state fairs were a big thing in and around they had a Norfolk fair out right. there on Lafayette Boulevard he spent about two to three weeks in each wow. place, wow. depending on how good it was. So how did he come to settle here? We came to Norfolk because he was interested in visiting all the Wild West shows and the state fairs and things like that. But he came here and he brought somebody with him to run the place. And this man 
that he bought had a room on 38th Street with with him, and they ran a, a, rented a room. Right there. Somehow, that man that he brought with him got the idea he was going to try his own at it. So he did it. He he put in a bid, which was better than my uncle, and he got it. And that was my uncle, and he had he had already made all the arrangements with the ice cream people. So what he did was uh, he told his buddies about it, and that was his his buddies told him come on to Ocean View, and he took a spot in Ocean View, and it turned out to be great. Uh, he got through the whole year. He never wore an overcoat, and oh he goodness. and he thought that was great. Yeah. And uh, he he started there, and that was the year that uh, Teddy Roosevelt started the Great White Fleet, and That's that was right. that was a big it was a big draw. In the and that was the year that. Uh, if I remember this, I don't remember it, but I'm told <laughs> that in 1907, uh, when they came down here for that Jamestown exposition, that that's really where they discovered the land on which the naval base sits today. Right. That was the site of it, right? Right. Yeah. And so that was a situation, that's fascinating, because you have a situation there where it looked like that was not going to go well for him because his partner took the idea and kind of set it up on his own. Right. But he wound up. I was gonna say making limeade out of limes, but that's not quite right. It's mm -hmm. kinda of close though. Yeah, so anyhow, Abe was satisfied with that location yeah. at Ocean View, thrilled to death. Because th that those ships going by just attracted tons of people. And uh, he so made, the amusement, amusement park was nearby there. Oh you know, he he was inside the amusement park. Right. Oh, so he got all the amusement Park folk. Yeah. Right. He kept on with Ocean View Park, and he uh, eventually built seven stands in the, in the hmm. Mile District of Ocean View. So how did how did we come to this location? Oh, in '33, that's when they had a hurricane mm -hmm. and destroyed Ocean View Park. Mm. And. Uh, that was a terror. I mean, people still talk about that storm. Right. So he got down there and, and saw that destruction. Six of his stands with their equipment disappeared. So that, basically, he lost everything in that storm. Yeah, right. He lost wow. it all. He was broke after that. Even though he'd lost everything. Yeah. So he decided to come downtown. What he did was rented a couple of lots from Mr. Talbot on the corner of 20th and Monticello. That would be Minton Talbot, I guess. Minton right? W. Talbot, right. And so he liked it, so he rent us a place where we could manufacture cones in the city of Norfolk on Talbot Street. So my father got on Talbot Street and made ice cream cones and wholesaled ice cream cones to whoever wanted to buy them. Mm. So he made some ice cream cones. Talbot Street lent him a, a store for $16.66 a month rent, payable in advance. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so how did he come to them this location? This, then he came down here and built a small shack, and it was a stucco building, but he built, built a frame first and then put stucco on it. At 34, they opened up here. Here? Right. Okay. And so, what was outside here in 34? Because you were a little boy at that yeah, point. Yeah, I was a young fellow. Yeah. But there was nothing on this street. Is that right? Wow. Right. Was this place instantly popular when it opened up? I would, I would say it wasn't that popular. Really? It really wasn't. So when do you think it started getting this iconic sense about it because I, I, I think uh, with my father the first thing he did was he paved a lot mm. that was the first big thing he did he paved a lot so that car and striped it up 
and that was one of the first things he did. Then he built a dance hall behind it. Really? Really did oh. a dance hall behind the original building. Now, you graduated from Maury right. High School. Right. In what, 1940? So did you work in the business as a child? Uh, yeah. I, I, I became, came to work, and, and I would work part-time a little bit at night. Mm -hmm. And all of us kids worked. But you went for a bit of time. You, uh, you joined the Navy right after high school. Is that right? Right. And, and, and that's sort of, uh, I guess, the, that was done in the, in the war years because the thinking was if you didn't join up, you were going to get drafted, right? Right. That was true. So you were fortunate after the war then that you had a business to come back into in a right. lot of ways because you know a lot of people didn't. So when you came back from the war and were working in the business, what what was this place like at that point? Well, it was a, during the war. It was a busy place. I can imagine. Then we come into the after the war. Then you come into the 1950s, and this place is hopping by the 1950s, isn't right. it? Right. Yeah. 1949, we decided to build a new place, and, and this was essentially what we built, what you see right here. And uh, we started, and right from the beginning, it was busy, really busy. Like right now, we have four curb wheels that work mostly. In, in the daytime and four at night. Mm -hmm. In those days, we'd work up to 10 or 12 girls at night. Wow, wow. Did you ever hire men for that position or was it always women? Well, everybody tried men. Uh -huh. it, it never worked. <laughs> That's interesting too because it reminds me that, you know, you, 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 this place has been here through an awful lot of social change. I mean, a lawful, you know, you had the, the, the women's movement, you had uh, civil rights movement, all of that taking place right. during the time that this location has been here. I see African-American people in this restaurant all the time. Was that always the case? Could, did African-American people come here in those days? Well, we have a section over there where we sold takeout orders. Right. And they would come up and get a takeout order. Oh, interesting. Could and they have come in inside or not? They could come inside, but I don't think we served them on oh, the inside. Interesting. Which, of course, was the way it was at that that's, time. That's right. Mm. Wow. So, so was that, um, do you remember that moment where you started yeah. serving African Americans? We just switched over without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. No fanfare, just did it. Just did it, that's all. And we, we hired, specifically hired some curb wheels at that time uh -huh. to break in the customs, really. Wow, that's and, interesting. And we did that. And your, your uh, curb girls never wore roller skates, as was very popular in, in right. the 50s, we because you're asphalt, right? Right, the asphalt. <laughs> It doesn't have any strength to it. Mm -hmm. So what you've got is where the car parks is a slight dip. So you'll have four little dips in right. there where you, the tires sit. So you really have to have concrete for the roller skates. So for roller skates, you, you can't operate without mm. the car. 60s and 70s, things just kind of went along the way they went along, right? Right. You come up to maybe the early 90s, and you get word that there may be some competition coming to town really close, as in next door. Right. We got a little competition. Uh, the fast food places came into town, and I think uh, McDonald's started right. first. Were you nervous about that? I think everybody gets nervous about competition, but uh, at that time, you stood in line mm -hmm. at McDonald's on the outside of the building. Right. 
So we didn't feel it so bad. But when you got word that Wendy's was moving in next door, I think what did got, you think then? Well, I think we got a little word then. Did you think about changing anything? Or did no, you? we didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. And we served them whatever they wanted. That's great. I mean, you still don't, you don't open on Sundays as a, as a we don't, rule. As a, as a general rule, we don't open on Sundays. But in 74, they had a gasoline ration in Norfolk. And then the city council wanted everybody to only operate 48 hours. Oh. See, so we cut out Sundays for a while. And when I opened back up on Sundays, all the churches had left. Uh, the, the big Baptist church had oh, right. burned down on Westover Avenue. And, and they, a lot of them went to Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. And our business dropped off to nothing. So you just said, we'll stay closed on Sunday? We'll stay closed, yeah. yeah we closed Everybody back. needs a break. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, this is a hard business. Right, it is. When I look at, at your menu, and I and I love everything on this menu, but as you look at this menu, I don't see, I'm just trying to think, just make sure I'm still correct on this. I don't see any veggie burgers. No. I don't see any big uh, grilled chicken Caesar salads. I don't see anything that we've seen in the last 10, 15 years or so that sort of is more health conscious. This menu still sells. People still coming in here to uh, to buy what I would say is great food, but the menu itself was the same. Was the same. Right. And since that time, your your son and your son-in-law now own the business. Right. So you sort of sold it to them, and and what was the deal on that in terms of your continued working? They uh, and they used me to make cones. One of the things we have is that our cones do not have a preservative. Mm. So it's a non-preservative thing. So you have to be careful, make sure you get airtight cans yeah. and things like that. And eat them fast, so you can <laughs> come back and get more. Yeah. <laughs> There's not a day that goes by I don't see some little preschool class or somebody out here with yeah. you showing them how to make those cones. Right, we do that all yeah. the time. And I'm looking too, you know, I, we were looking earlier at some um, yearbooks. You have a whole great collection of yearbooks over here from local high schools. Right, I tell you, I got a lot of yearbooks from people donating them to yeah. me. But you know, people love looking at those yearbooks. Right. And what do you think they love seeing there? What is that well, about? Well, they want to see their fathers yeah. and their grandparents. Yeah. I found my father-in-law in there. Yeah. <laughs> Class of 37, so you were 40, right? I was yeah. 40, right. But you know, I think when you look in those yearbooks, you really see some of the names of people who now are in power and in business and in political life in this community. Right. So you've sort of seen those people grow up in this place in a lot of ways. Right. You got any secrets on any of them? <laughs> no. <laughs> and you wouldn't tell me if you did, would you? No. <laughs> but they still come in. I mean, right. every time I come in here, I see somebody either a political figure, a business leader, something like that. Right. So we've had some people that say they've been coming in 50 years, all the time. That's great. And your, your um, <laughs> wait staff behind the counter here, is, they, they all stay a pretty long time. Yeah, they are old time. We yeah. try to keep them. That's good. Yeah. So, is, so do you see a time when you will not be making cones, or do you? It looks like I'll be making cones forever. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Dumar, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank oh, you so much. It's just been you, so Kathy. much fun. Thank you. In a fickle, trend-driven consumer market, Dumar's continuing success is a marvel. 
from the class of 39 to the class of 2009, Dumars is a special place. When asked why she loved Dumars, one recent high school graduate said, I've been going there since I was a baby. The food is cheap and heavenly, and seeing Mr. Dumar at the cone machine makes it feel like home. And that's a sentiment that will surely stand the test of time. I'm Kathy Lewis. We'll see you next time, maybe right here at Dumars. Thank you.